And I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, I'm going to get kidnapped. And every time I stop and turn to talk to him, he gives me a little jab in the back with the rifle. Welcome to Nature's Guardians. I'm Micah Siegel, and each week I talk with people working to save and help animals around the world. They are Nature's Guardians, and you can become one too. Today I'm talking with Boone Smith, an internationally known wildlife tracker. Welcome to the show, Boone. Hey, Micah. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, looking forward to the conversation. So how'd you get started tracking animals? Oh, man, that's, I think it's the only thing I've ever known. When I was a little kid growing up, I grew up on a cattle ranch in southeast Idaho. I had a grandpa who was a rancher. So for me, tracking and things like that was just part of life. My, my dad and grandpa were ranchers. They had a pretty big ranch, ran a lot of cows. And I think back to the times when I was like a little kid and I was first going out with my grandpa and we'd go out, saddle up horses and we'd go out to go cow drives and things like that, or just go check on the cows. And he would be constantly pointing at the ground and saying, hey, look at this right here. What is this? And, and helping me learn to recognize tracks. They taught me how to trap. If you're going to be a trapper, you've got to learn tracks. For example, we would come across the lion track and my dad would instantly be, what's that track? And what is it doing? Is it a male? Is it a female? And of course, when I was little, I didn't know those things. And so they were constantly getting off the horse, getting down and showing me and teaching me why it was a male, why it was a female what this direction of travel might mean and, and things like that. So what was your first professional tracking assignment? My first job out of college, I actually worked for the Hornocker Wildlife Institute. Maurice Hornocker is the godfather in mountain lion conservation. So this guy, you know how cool he is. He, the first radio callers that went on mountain lions, he did that in central Idaho on a study in the 1960s. I got a job working for him on a mountain lion, wolf, grizzly bear, black bear interaction project. And I was part of the mountain lion component. And that took place in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I met a guy named John Beecham, who was one of his, in charge of that project, one of his board of directors. We met in Shubbuck, Idaho at, at a, a gas station. And I sat on the tailgate of a pickup and got interviewed for that job. And a few months later, I started work there in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It was the first place I worked as a wildlife biologist. And so my day-to-day is on that, like every morning, get up way before the sun was up, head out, look for mountain lion tracks, um, hopefully find some. So then we would use hounds uh, to catch them, chase them up trees. We'd dart them, get them on the ground, take a bunch of measurements, put them a really fancy collar on their neck, some real expensive jewelry. And then once we had the collars on, my job was then to go out and follow the collared animals and find kill sites and things like that. So I literally spent every day following mountain lions and documenting if the wolves had crossed their tracks or coming to kill sites, if there were bears at the kill sites, grizzly bears and things like that. And so I got really lucky and right out of the gate, I stumbled into this kind of paradise to go track animals. Did you get a biology degree? And if you did, where? So I was, I was probably like a lot of kids. I didn't know what I was going to do in life. I changed my major a time or two. I finally settled on wildlife biology. I graduated from Utah State University with a bachelor's in fisheries and wildlife. And then in the course of working in Jackson Hole, probably five, six years later, I went back to grad school for wildlife biology with the focus of my work on that stuff was predation rates and things like that in mountain lions. Um, I always make sure I tell people that the things that made me really good at my job, I was lucky enough to learn when I was a kid. My dad and grandpa teaching me how to tell tracks, how to trap, how to snare, how to run hounds. I didn't learn any of those things at school, but I had some really great teachers growing up. And despite having some knowledge and working with people that are way smarter than me and had a lot more schooling, those things that I learned outside of school proved to be really valuable and helpful. What are some of your best stories on tracking? If you get into tracking, I really like it because you're you're solving this mystery, this story while you're going through the woods, right? Some of my best ones that, that I maybe am proudest of were when I was doing capture work. I was actually in South Africa and we were working, I was actually working with National Geographic at that point. We were trying to film um, lions and follow pride and some things like that. And there was this great big male lion that every once in a while he would break away from the pride and he'd go on his own. And I was hanging out with the rangers one day and they were super cool. And we decided that day that we were going to actually track this big male. And so we didn't have snow or anything like that. We just picked up his you know, paw prints in the sand and we started to track him. And for me, that was one of the biggest rushes because this male lion was probably over 500 pounds and he was just gorgeous. Like just 
the ideal great big African lion. And so we're tracking him alone. And so the way we do it is I'm always looking down as a tracker. You're not looking up all the time. And the hard part about that is being safe, right? And so two of the rangers, one of them would walk behind me and the other one would be just off to my side. And he was constantly just scanning, looking for something to make sure we didn't get caught funny. And then my job was just to go track to track. Anyway, long story short, we tracked this guy for the better part of the morning. And as we were coming up to this pass, the way the sun was, we knew that the other side of the pass was going to be in the shade. So we circled to kind of get out of the wind and not give our presence up. And sure enough, we got around on the other side and he's in slam. When we circled out, we gave up our wind to him. So that means we let him smell us. And even though he hadn't seen us, he started to talk at us from the bush. And if you ever heard a lion growl or snarl or roar, there's something about it. It's like a little lightning bolt through you. And I remember him talking. We're about 40, 50 yards away. And it was just super awesome. And it was probably one of my favorite tracking experiences that I had. How many trackers are there in the world? How many trackers in the world? Oh, man, a lot. <laughs> I'll drop a name to you, Mark Elbrock. If you're interested in a tracking book, that guy wrote the book on it. Um, I worked with him on a bunch of projects. This is the guy that can tell you what the insect tracks are, right? This guy can track down to insects and mice and tell you what three-toed sloth came by. And like he's super amazing. So there are some guys in the world that just are, that's what they've dedicated a lot of time to. And they're super good at it. And guys, kind of the old school, you get into Africa and places like that. Some of the folks that are living in the bush, that's what they do. Some of those villages that are still out there where they hunt a lot, there's some guys that are super amazing. And So for me, I've been really fortunate and blessed to be able to go to some of these places and work with some of these guys and learn some of the tricks of the trade, if you will, little things to look for, because different environments are always different. Right? When I got hired once to go to Afghanistan to trap snow leopards, I'd never seen a snow leopard except for in a zoo. And so I dove into every piece of literature I could about snow leopards to learn as much as I could about them. And in the end, after gathering all this information, I decided they were similar in a lot of way to mountain lions. So as I went there over to try and catch one of these to put a GPS collar on, I decided I was going to hunt and trap and track it like I would a mountain lion. And some of those things paid off and we were fortunate enough to catch snow leopards and, and get some collars on it. We, we saw that video. That's how we found you on oh, National yeah? Geographic. Cool. They posted a video of you with snow leopards tracking them. Yeah, that was one of my, honestly, probably one of the craziest experiences I've ever been on. I got over there and there's a bunch of people there that were dedicating their lives to, to learning about snow leopards and the natural resources there in Afghanistan. So that's one of the projects I was super proud to be part of. And when I was there, one of the coolest things I learned about these guys, and it was super humbling for me, we were sitting there, we catch a snow leopard there finally. We get out there and we catch one. And we're all excited and we want to take pictures with it and get everybody together. And these guys were like, hey, we can't take pictures. And I'm like, man, why wouldn't you want to show your family this stuff? We just caught the first snow leopard ever in Afghanistan. This is the coolest thing ever. And as I got to know these guys and talk to about them, talk to them about things is if somehow it got found out that they were working with an American organization, them themselves and their families would get targeted by the Taliban and potentially all of them could get killed because they had associated with this U.S. entity, this group that was part of the United States. And it was, I thought I was pretty bad A going over there, to be honest with you. And it was so humbling because I was risking nothing and their dedication and commitment to wildlife and conservation to the point where their own families didn't know what they did. They kept it a secret. Like they were superheroes with a secret identity, which was so amazing. And it's been so inspirational. The coolest thing in the world I've ever seen is people that were so dedicated and amazing and super good at what they did. That's dope. That's like the spies of the animal conservation world. Yeah, man, like these guys, like to me, it was so scary. You wanted to give them so much credit and they were learning. And one of the coolest things I got from that is I'd been gone for, I don't know, maybe six months and they got hold of me and sent me a picture of a snow leopard that they caught by themselves without any of us being there. So they found the location, they set the snare right, they immobilized it, they got the collar on and they got it and they did it on their own. And that was one of the things we were there to do was help train them to do that. What other exotic places have you been to? Oh man, I've been super fortunate. I've traveled a lot of places. I've worked a handful of places in Africa, South Africa, Botswana, and Zambia. I've spent a lot of time in South America, in the Patagonia region, which I absolutely love. That's a super neat place, amazing landscape. And there's pumas down there, the Southern mountain lions. Um, when I started doing, I worked as wild biologist for about seven years full time. And at the end of that, 
I started to transition into kind of, I call myself a capture guy. I was really good at that end of it. I was really good at tracking. I was really good at catching animals. I was really, I learned a lot of super great things about being safe and keeping animals safe and, and using and drugs and immobilizing them and getting the, the collars on. And so I started hiring out just to show up and do the, the cool stuff to wherever, whoever, I'll catch and call your animals. And in the process of that, I ended up working a little bit with National Geographic. And in the course of that, man, it gave me a handful of years there where I think I caught jaguars in Belize. I caught jaguars in Brazil, pumas in Chile and Argentina. I did a, a weird thing. It wasn't a capture gig. I went and did a little film thing with Nat Geo. And we went around and filmed and studied urban animals that were doing surviving in your backyard type thing. And that let me go to Australia and Canada and Russia and India, Africa. What's been your most challenging assignment? That's a pretty tough question. Every place is different. Right now, I work on some projects in, in Nevada here in the United States. And I'd never spent a lot of time in the desert. It was new for me because I've been in the jungles. I've been in the mountains. And I really like those. And the desert was hard. The mountain lion densities were really low. So encountering tracks was really hard. We very rarely have snow, so tracking is really tough, and it's a lot of rocky soil. And then you're out there in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes I'm five, six hours off the pavement, and there was no phone service. For 10 days, all I had to do was talk to myself and talk to my dogs. <laughs> and so that was super challenging because I was in an environment I didn't know, I wasn't familiar with, and I had no one out there to help me. When I was in Jackson Hole, we have time in the winter there where it's negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit for a couple of weeks in the winter, sometimes worse than that. That's hard to want to go outside. <laughs> That's hard to get on the snowmobile and go. It's hard on dogs and everything. And So every place has its own unique challenges depending on where you go. Was there ever a project where you didn't get animal? Part of the capture gig and stuff like that, there's always failure in it. So I've worked on a lot of projects where we've failed to get out as many callers as we wanted or we had to come back around and do it again the next year because we didn't get animals caught. One of the best things I've learned from some of the guys I've worked with is just being tenacious. If I go there enough and stick with it enough, eventually I'll catch that cat on the right loop and I'll be in the right place and we'll be able to capitalize. I always say a lot of my stuff's cats and predators. And, and you start to look at home ranges like that first snow leopard we collared in Afghanistan and that GPS collar was working. Three days later, he was 90 miles as the crow flies from where we'd caught him. And that seems like it a lot, and it is a lot. But then you start to think we're in the Himalayas. We collared him, he was at about 10,000 feet above sea level. But to get that 90 miles away, he had to cross three or four mountains that the passes were at like 20,000. And then you realize, how did we catch that cat? When he's, we wanted him to step in a snare the size of a dinner plate, and all that up and down and millions of just square feet out there, hundreds of thousands of square miles. And so those are the challenges that come with that. And so with that, there's always going to be some failures. And if you got the right mindset of, I'm going to learn from this, I'm going to figure out a new trick. That, and that's the fun part of it. I like figuring out the new tricks. Here's what works on something else, doesn't work here. What's my new trick I'm going to learn to make this happen? Whether I use a lot more cameras or I use calls or in some places, Patagonia, for example, when we're down there, I use my binoculars. I'm glassing up mountain lions on the pumas on the side of the mountain, and which I've never done that anywhere else. And so learning new tricks and trying to figure out how to beat the failures is a super fun part of it, actually. Know that. Do you ever get any surprises in the middle of the night? <laughs> One of the coolest surprises I ever had, I'll, I'll tell you two stories on these because they were awesome. The first one, I was in Brazil and we were trying to catch and radio collar jaguars. And I was working with a biologist there. His name was Juarez Esme. One of the coolest guys I've ever met, good friend to this day, knows as much about jaguars as anybody as I've ever met. We were, we were trying to catch them in foot snares. And it was our job to go out. And during the day, we would close all the snares because it would get really hot. And we didn't want to catch some other animal, a non-target. And the jaguars didn't move during the day. So we worked at nights. So every night, right before dark, we'd go out and open up all the snares. And it was about our last snare we were opening up. And we pull up in the truck, we're on, on a levee and we jump out and I'm grabbing some stuff out of the back of the truck and, and Juarez is uncovering the snare and we're going to rebait it. I think we were using some fish, some piranha we caught or something like that to bait the snare. 
And there is this growl that comes and it's a jaguar and he's 15 yards from the snare and just happened to be where he bedded down. And it's a wall of green in the jungle. And it scared us to death. <laughs> like I remember we looked at each other and he's right there and you can hear him moving in the brush, but you can't see him. And I grab a big spotlight and I'm shining it, trying to, I'm talking at him because you do that a lot with animals. You talk at them to let them know, you know, they're there and, and a safety thing. And as fast as we can, we're trying to help each other set this snare and get out of there. He was giving us a warning. Hey, you guys are close enough. And we got that snare set as fast as we could and we took off. And the cool part about that one is curiosity got the cat because an hour later, our transmitter on our snare went off and he was in it. And he finally couldn't resist walking up and checking out what we'd been doing there. Another surprise that I had that was pretty cool is on the snow leopard thing in Afghanistan. I still don't know what to make of this to this day, but we'd caught our first snow leopard. We got a collar on it. Things were going good. We, we'd been running snares for about eight more days and hadn't had any success. And we were sitting around the campfire late at night, just about to go to bed. And one of the cameramen kind of shined a light off to the side and a snow leopard had come down and it was like 40 yards from our camp. And we got his eyes shining a light and he'd just come down to check us out. And it was just a glimpse and then he was gone. That was a pretty cool experience, just something we didn't expect to see. Have you ever had any problems with people while you're out tracking? People are always the biggest problem, aren't they? <laughs> um, what I do, usually I'm pretty remote and I don't have to deal with a lot of people, which I personally really like. Every once in a while, we run into somebody that maybe doesn't quite understand what we're doing or things like that. And as far as dangers to me, I can share this story now because my mom knows. When we were in Afghanistan, when we flew into Kabul, the plan was to then take a four-day journey via truck to where we were going to work and, and trap. And because the Taliban was burning people out along the way, that wasn't an option. And so we ended up catching a, a little puddle jumper plane that was flying in for medical stuff way back in the Himalayas to these villages. And so that's how we got in there. And we were in between Pakistan and Tajikistan and a little finger there. And, and so the borders were actually really watched, even though it's all mountains. And... We just arrived there that day. We were getting settled. We were going to do some stuff that night. What I didn't know is we were supposed to check in with Border Patrol. And it was late, so we didn't. And we should have. In hindsight, we should have. But we finished up stuff that night. And what I didn't know is Border Patrol had observed someone through a spotting scope the day before coming across the high mountain path. They didn't know who it was or where they went. That night, I walked from a building we'd been having dinner in to go over to another one where we had our trapping supplies, and I was going to start putting together snares and get stuff ready. And I had to walk through a field for about 100 yards. And it was dark, and so I had a headlamp on. Headlamps weren't a normal thing in Afghanistan. And halfway through there, somebody saw my headlamp, and it was Border Patrol, and they came over and wondered if I was the guy that had been sneaking across. And I was clearly dressed different. I'm bigger than most folks over there. And I stood out, and of course, I spoke nothing of any language there and when they came out of the dark they came out with ak-47s and the first guy walked up to me and he tapped me in the chest on the sternum with that ak-47 a couple of times yelling at me in a language i didn't know but i knew enough to say here's my hands man <laughs> and when i first got to afghanistan they talked about we had some briefings on how to be safe when one of the things they talked about what happens if you get kidnapped and they told us that if terrorists attack and you don't die in the first 20 seconds, you're probably going to get kidnapped. So FYI. So I kept pointing back at the building I'd come from telling these guys I wanted to go over here. And I'm dropping every name I know. Hussein, Ali, like I'm telling the couple guys I've met and they don't understand me. And they start to walk me away. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, I'm going to get kidnapped. And every time I stop and turn to talk to him, he gives me a little jab in the back with the rifle. And finally, we just happened to walk by the building that I was going to. And it actually had a locked door and I had a key with a lanyard for it hanging on the front. Showed him the key that I had it so it wasn't a fluke thing. And I put it in the door, showed that I unlocked it, could unlock it and started doing charades with these guys. And I finally joked and laughed with them enough. The gun came down a little. And when one of them finally joked and laughed back with me, I turned and walked in the building and sat down at the desk and started doing stuff, pretending like I knew what I was doing. Fortunately for me, these guys were reasonably enough trained and they went and asked some questions despite poking a gun in my chest for a bunch there i met them the next day and i've got a picture with these two border guards border patrol guards the next day with their guns that potentially were going to shoot me the night before <laughs> and so that's probably my worst people problem i've had is i thought somebody was going to shoot me outside of that it's more people maybe messing with your traps, cameras some of it's not knowing what you're doing or going 
What advice would you give to kids who are interested in this kind of stuff? Go get outside. Go do it. I'm, I'm pretty lucky. I live in Idaho. I spend a lot of time in Wyoming, Idaho, you know, the Montana. It's, the West is phenomenal and amazing. But just wherever you're at, go get outside, whether it's a city park or something. Get outside and start paying attention. To Watch what the squirrels do. Watch what the birds do. Um, look at their habits. Nature's a cool thing, man. Like, it's just, it's endless. Like, I haven't even, I, I know this much. There's so much to learn still and go and do and people that have expertises and go and so get outside and enjoy it. Too many times I think we're scared of what's out there. I have people tell me all the time, like, oh, I don't want to see a mountain lion. And I'm like, oh, you do want to see a mountain lion. It's awesome. Coolest experience of your life. Are there tracking camps where you can learn how to track? Ironically, yes, there are. Um, my friend that I mentioned earlier, Mark Elbrock, he actually runs tracking clinics all over the United States. And you can essentially go and over time, you can't do it all in one class. You can come back, you know, for a few years and things, and you can pass off and become essentially what's a master tracker. And so there are some things like that available that, that people can actually go and do. So if we need you to come track down some rhinos in Africa, you're available? I could probably make myself self available to come do some of that stuff. You, you said the rhinos, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story. When I was down there tracking African lions, they had some white rhinos down there really close to where we were working. And they had two guys that were assigned as their protectors. So there were these two guys that they actually they had guns and they were on dirt bikes. They gave them some dirt bikes to keep up and go with the rhinos. And one of these guys was, this, was with these rhinos day and night because poaching was so probable and they were so rare and endangered that even the bad guys kept track of where the last few were. And I was really surprised they trained these anti-poaching teams and these guys are amazing. They're, they're awesome. But there's such a disadvantage because they've got, I think these guys had AK-47s and they had dirt bikes and they had binoculars. The bad guys had military grade infrared night vision, helicopters. The tech wasn't even fair how they did. And is what would happen is because gunshots make noise, right? The, the poachers would come in at night and they would actually dart the rhinos, but they wouldn't measure out dosages that would be safe or things like that, or, or use drugs that would be safe to them. They would dart them, so they'd just fall over and go to sleep, right? But then they'd never reverse them, and they'd jump out and cut off their horns and do whatever. And the level of technology that these guys got to protect and go against, it's not even fair. And so, again, really cool to see people that dedicated their time and their lives to just being in danger because they were, the bad guys weren't afraid to shoot at them to get what they wanted at things. And so there's, you talk about tracking rhinos and things like that. There's some guys that are pretty amazing out in the world and live with those things and spend their whole life just taking care of those endangered species. And that's pretty amazing. What are your favorite animals that you track most or care about most? Oh, my favorite animals. I'm a cat guy. I'm a big cat guy. I don't think that's a secret. All my time working with, most of it working with Nat Geo was big cat stuff. I've grown up on mountain lions. I just love them. I love everything about them. I love tracking them. I love catching them. I love putting GPS collars on them. I love following them to see what they killed, what they ate, crazy things they do, crazy places they go. You live in the Rockies and the forests. What do you see for animals in, in where you live for the next 30 years? So I'm living in Idaho. There's been a lot of people moving to Idaho in the last 10 years. It is a growing state and people want to live in the countryside and they want to live in the woods. And I get it. It's awesome. It's a great place to be. But with all the humans moving in, we're, we're building houses and towns and things like that. We're building a wildlife habitat. We probably have more mountain lion sightings in Idaho than we've ever had before. And that doesn't ne isn't necessarily because we have more lions than we've ever had. That's actually not true. We don't have as many as we have at other times. But people are there more. And so that management, I think, becomes more important than it's ever been to make sure we have a balance, to make sure we keep some places wild so that we can always have big predators. We can always have the, the moose and the elk and the deer and the big ungulate populations. And so the next 30 years, I actually think are really critical. There's been a lot of great research done for a long time. We're using that a lot, but I think the future research to come to ensure that we've got that balance is going to be more important than ever. I think the future is definitely bright for things. I, I don't think we're going to lose populations and species and things like that, but I think that's going to be really based upon good management, good research, and people looking down the road a little more than maybe they have before. What would you like to tell our audience about your career as a wildlife guy? 
Yeah, man. Being a wildlife guy has been awesome. I love the outdoors. Honestly, like when I first went to school, I was trying to decide on a major. I thought at that time, physical therapy was like a really popular major. And after about one semester of classes, I just think this is not for me. I got to be outside when there's pros and cons to that. There were times when I was probably sleeping on the ground 200 to 250 days of the year. <laughs> like I wasn't sleeping in a bed. I spent summers in Jackson Hole where I only actually took a shower maybe once every three weeks or so at a friend's house. And the rest of the time I was taking a bath in a cold creek every night. And so I look at that and some people go, that sucks. That's awful. I loved it. If you can, you find your love and what you want to do, like go after and do it. And the wild's a great place to do that. Nature's big and there's endless stuff and there's tons of opportunities. Thanks for talking today, Boone. Hey, Micah, thanks for having me. I love sharing experiences and talking about all the wild stuff and the adventures. And again, I appreciate you having me here. And thank you for watching. You can help animals by hitting the like button and subscribing to this channel. I'll see you next time on Nature's Guardians. Bye.